It's been a while. I don't think I mentioned this before, but I was an audio engineer for a little while. I did a few recordings, got a few minor production credits. So today I want to talk about audio engineers. See, across the landscape of modern music, there have been numerous technical innovations that have driven the direction music has taken, from Les Paul's multi-channel recording, the switch to stereo, the format changes from shellac to vinyl to cassettes to CDs. Today, though, I want to focus on two engineers and their direct and outsized contribution, not only to a music, but to a culture that, without their work, probably wouldn't exist as it does today. This is the story of Headley Jones and King Tubby, the engineers who made the dance hall. The story of the modern dance hall starts back in the 1940s, after the end of World War II. I mentioned this time briefly in my video on Uri and other early DJs, but we can dive deeper now. At the time, Jamaica was still a British colony, and so the opportunity to move to Britain after the war was an appealing prospect. This began draining the dance halls of Kingston of their musicians. And while Britain was appealing in its own way, at home Jamaica was spinning up its tourism business and remaining musicians took up residencies on the north coast in Ocho Rios, Montego Bay, playing hotels and resorts. Well, now look around. The dance halls of Kingston were emptying. Enter the sound system. It's often repeated that sound systems won favour through being cheaper than live bands, but it was more due to the siphoning of musicians out of Kingston combined with technical advances in sound systems and in recording. Technical advances pushed forward by our first protagonist, Headley Jones. He was born in 1917 and, as a young man, worked repairing all manner of electronics and mechanics, as well as playing music himself. In 1943, he joined the Royal Air Force, trained as a radar engineer and served in Europe until the close of World War II, returning to Jamaica in '46. This is where we pick up his story. Now, I want to get a little tricky with definitions, because Headley Jones was the owner of the first sound system. but. Sound systems kind of existed before him. They just weren't in any way what we would consider a Jamaican sound system today. They were public address systems fitted to play old shellac recordings. Jones was the first to design and build a sound system specifically to play records. And not just any records, but new high fidelity records. Now I'm going into the weeds here because, well, it interests me, but it also took several hours of reading through old hi-fi and radio reviews, and I really don't want that time to go to waste. So all of the systems that were in Jamaica prior to Jones were driven by commercially available amplifiers, which in 1947 were described as adequate. They would have a frequency response from 40 hertz to about 10,000 hertz. That's good enough for a little music, a little entertainment, but nowhere near good enough to become a true cultural revolution. Jones based his first amplifier on the popular Williamson model. To contrast with what we just heard was the standard at the time, Williamson published details of an amp that had a remarkable standard of performance, a frequency response that was absolutely flat between 10 hertz and 100,000 hertz. It wasn't perfect, but it was significantly ahead of commercial amplifiers available at the time. And even more importantly, not just for Jones, but for everyone, it was cheap. Okay, so this is kind of a side note, but the reason the Williamson was so cheap were twofold. Firstly, it was a schematic. So you built it yourself, no labor costs involved. But secondly, the parts used in it were common in US military equipment. The Second World War had just ended two years prior, and equipment was decommissioned, projects put on hold. Basically, there were a lot of military parts floating around, flooding the market. This is, I think, vital to understanding why custom sound systems caught on so quickly in Jamaica. Without the know-how of Headley Jones, history might have broken differently, but the cost was also important. The blueprints provided by Williamson meant Jones could take advantage of wartime developments in recording formats that other systems just weren't equipped for. Jones notes he was also able to incorporate a rudimentary EQ into his new amp. 
Okay, let me read you this from his first outing with the new system, playing records in front of his record store. On that occasion, he had a dance to play for at one of the lawns in Kingston, known as Jubilee Tile Gardens. It was opposite my place. Jones pauses. He tastes the exact instant when he started playing Perez Prado records from across the street. In Jamaican parlance, he playfully grins, that flopped Tom's dance. So the Tom he's referring to here is Tom Wong. And two days later, Tom would swing by Headley Jones record store and order a custom amp of his own. This was the birth of Tom the Great Sebastian, the first great sound system of the dancehall era. Headley Jones was able to provide a bigger sound and a better sound than any other system in Kingston at the time, but more than that, his system was a custom rig. And truly, ever since 1950, sound system culture has been one of DIY, experimentation, and customization. Perhaps someone else would have set them on their way, but it was the former RAF engineer, Headley Jones, that was the one becoming the true grandfather of sound systems, harboring reggae, dub, dancehall, and laterally drum and bass and jungle sounds. Without him, perhaps the improved commercial amplifiers of the mid to late 50s hit Jamaica and took off before the custom rigs he was building. And then perhaps the DIY nature of the sound system doesn't catch on in the same way. For all of this, I believe Jones had a seriously outsized impact on the very nature of the dancehall and sound system culture at large. And maybe that would be enough for one video, but the music doesn't stop evolving in the 1950s. And so we're not gonna stop there. The recognizable sound of the dancehall morphed over the next several decades, and often these changes involved collaboration, slow evolution in sound. There is one other period in time that I'd argue a single person had that same outweighted influence on the direction of the dancehall as Headley Jones, and that was King Tubby. King Tubby started out with similar beginnings to Jones as a radio and TV repairman in Kingston. In 58, about a decade after Jones' first foray, Tubby entered the dancehall scene with his own system, Tubby's hometown hi-fi. In fast fashion, Tubby's became a premier sound, owing to his technical prowess, yes, but also his desire to push boundaries and innovate what a sound system could do. Tubby came onto the scene at the right time and would become wholly influential in the direction of the dancehall, but also remixing as an art. Let's start as we should with the dancehall and a story that no matter the teller always changes a little. There are three fairly solid versions that I want to share and this is the story of how rhythm versions came to be. Firstly, as pioneer DJ Dennis Al Capone tells it, Word had got around all week Tubbies was going to do something special. Nobody knew what. He had four dub plates he'd made from Treasure Isle Rocksteady tunes. Trojan Records suggests it wasn't at all planned though. Tubby managed to knock out the vocal channel on at least one of these records. The mistake wasn't spotted until his selector put the stylus on the acetate in the dance. And Bunny Lee contended that Tubby didn't debut the style at all. A sound system operator by the name of Ruddy Redwood was cutting some rhythms with vocal. The engineer made a mistake and it was gonna stop and Ruddy said, no man, make it run. Ruddy was playing next Saturday. They play the rhythm and the dance gets so excited. I come back into town, I say, Tubbs, boy, that mistake we made, the people them love it. My theory here is that Bunny Lee and Dennis have it right, that another system played out a rhythm version first, and then Tubby prepped the big reveal for the Kingston crowd. This introduction of rhythm versions, purely instrumental cuts of records already out in the wild, gave extra space for DJs to become more creative and gave the crowd something different but not wholly unfamiliar. In this way, Tubby and DJ Uroy ushered in a new era of the dancehall, with the DJ in a starring role. I could go on for a couple of hours in the ways that technology has brought about innovation in music, and Tubby's story is no different. 
While versions were a huge hit and quickly permeated the culture of the dancehall, Tubby moved on to pioneering the remix. As recording studios went from two to four and even eight track recording, this gave Tubby a lot of extra room to work with, and he started experimenting with ways of reshaping tunes, dropping instruments in and out as he had with vocals before adding extra processing. This was Tubby again, seeing the potential in new technology and messing around with it until he created what we now call dub music. Sitting between competition and collaboration with the great Lee Scratch Perry, these two men together would form a clear vision for dub music. Using tape delay, reverb, and EQ, they created a whole new composition entirely out of original recordings and their craft became a blueprint for remixing in every genre to follow. Would this have happened without Tubby? Certainly not in the way that it did, and his drive to innovate given to him by the dance hall that rewarded every innovation he brought to the table underpinned the development of numerous sounds that have lasted to the modern day. See, Headley Jones and King Tubby are two of the most important figures in Jamaican music, and King Tubby stands out as one of the most important figures in music, full stop, in the last 50 years. Both of these men enabled in their vision by new technology, and their willingness to embrace and experiment with it rewarded the world with a richer musical experience. I'm tracing the trail of the remix forward in time from Tubby, but That'll be a story for another day. We've already way overshot in this one. So thank you very much for making it all the way through to the end, indulging my tangents and all. Until the next one, thank you for watching. How have I, how have I not put anything out this year? Like this is, this is it. This is the first thing I put out in 2022.